Hi, everyone. Good morning. Stacy and I are here because we are super excited to announce that we are, our and a couple other courses are all together in LinkedIn Learning's new Pathfinder. Um, so they've got these new um, kind of chunks of courses that you can watch to make sure that you're getting what you need to hone in on specific skills. So hi, Stacy. Thanks for Hello. joining me today. <laughs> Excited to be here and participate with Catherine. Uh, we've actually known each other for uh, quite a while now. And um, I think when I met you, I don't think I realized you were also a LinkedIn instructor. So <laughs> just nice to, you know, bring it all together. And um, I see Oh, it was Kamisha that posted. Awesome. Okay. Hi, Kamisha. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And we've got Sarah says, can you direct me to the link to participate? Um, so you can go ahead and participate as you are, Sarah, right now. And I did just put the link to the um, LinkedIn Learning Pathfinder too. So feel free to to join or to watch that later. So um, yeah, it's funny how things come full circle because I remember your name from way back when you were part of the conference. The I think it was CalSherm or I don't remember which conference it was. Uh, and you were, the California HR conference, yeah. Okay, yeah. And then I started seeing you on LinkedIn Learning. I'm like, I think that's the same Stacey Gordon. So it's funny how that, that all works. <laughs> That's definitely, awesome. definitely. So, so those of us, those of you that don't know us, I see some of you do know us, and it's so exciting to see names that we recognize. Um, but I'm Stacy Gordon. I am a diversity, equity, inclusion strategist. Um, I've actually done quite a bit around careers as well. I used to recruit and career coach, which is why one of my courses is on diversity recruiting, which is the course that is included in this Pathfinder. So we're going to be talking a little bit more from sort of a uh, a lens of what do you have to do if you're in talent acquisition to kind of, you know, navigate through the changes that are coming up. Um, and I let Catherine sort of introduce herself as well for those of you that don't know her. Yeah, thank you. So Catherine Matice, founder of Civility Partners, and I've been in HR for just over 20 years and uh, have uh, Civility Partners is focused on strategy and company culture specifically. Um, and so the course that's in this Pathfinder from me is my strategic HR course, which is one of my most popular courses. Um, so it's about, you know, moving from kind of the putting out fires task oriented type of HR into partnering with the leaders to figure out how to help the organization achieve its goals using its greatest asset, its people. So i um, excited to chat with you again, Stacey. I always love our chats. <laughs> yes, yes. So if I'm hoping that you have watched both of our courses. If you haven't as yet, that's totally fine. But if you have and you've got specific questions for us, please put them into the chat because we will answer as many questions as we can today. So feel free to just throw them, throw them in there and we will follow up on those. Um, if you haven't watched the course, then um, we will go ahead and put the course links in as well. I know we, so we've got this Pathfinder. So what is happening is LinkedIn is trying to make it easier for you to find courses um, and also to curate things that are going to um, uh, what, make it easier for you to you know, navigate a specific career path. Uh, I know when I started, <clears throat> excuse me, when I started with uh, what was lindo.com, um, gosh, like seven years ago now, it was a very different landscape. There were not as many courses. Now there are so many courses. It can be hard to navigate through the course library and see what's there. So I'm really excited that um, LinkedIn is doing this and kind of curating the courses for you. And I'll say with the caveat that don't let that, you know, don't stop there, right? Just because we've put five courses into a learning path doesn't mean that's all you need to do, right? There's so many other courses for you, but this is a nice way to kind of start, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so many courses. You could watch LinkedIn Learning for a lifetime. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 indeed. Um, so the, the courses that we have, like you said, the um, diversity recruiting and strategic HR, and you might think, well, what does that have to do with each other? And part of it is just this idea that um, what we're looking at is what is it going to take for you to navigate through, right? Because talent acquisition has changed dramatically in the last handful of years. I, I know I'm in a couple of groups where uh, I I feel really bad for recruiters. I'm like, oh, thank goodness I made a career shift at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man, especially right now. Man, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard out there for talent acquisition folks. Um, and especially if you're an HR department of one, right? You're doing talent acquisition, you're doing payroll, you're doing everything, right? You're doing strategic HR. So there's a lot that is going on. And um, I think in this climate of um, what everyone's calling the great resignation, but LinkedIn has called it the great reshuffle, I think is what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. I literally have been calling it the great reevaluation mm -hmm. because I feel like that's kind of a little more <laughs> on par with I what mean, we're that, doing. Yeah, right? that's what's happening. People aren't just reshuffling for no reason. They're reshuffling because they're reevaluating. Yes. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. So if you're on this call today and you are reevaluating your life choices, I do not blame you, um, but I would hope that our courses will be able to help you to navigate that, right? And that's kind of the, the idea of today is to be able to answer questions and help you navigate um, challenges that you might be having. So again, if you've got questions, please put them into the chat. We would be happy to, um, to answer those. But I guess we can start with some common questions, right, that people will have a lot of times when they're thinking about, um, you know, HR and recruiting. And I think one of them is even the relationship, right, between HR and, and talent acquisition and what that looks like. And I know you said you've been in HR for, you know, 20 years, right? So how, how do you see that, that relationship sort of playing out? Yeah, well, I think, you know, first of all, talent acquisition certainly falls under the umbrella of, of human resources, but it is fascinating to see how human resources has branched out. And there are so many components. There's benefits and compensation. There's a payroll could even be its own if you have a large enough company, um, talent acquisition, employee experience. I mean, these are all components of HR that weren't there even 10 years ago. I mean, employee experience is a relatively new term. And I think, you know, it speaks to company culture and all of that. I do really and truly believe that HR, and I wrote a blog post about this recently, HR has been able through COVID to really demonstrate the value that they bring. And I've been saying, you know, I'm happy to be a part of the HR industry because we are the professionals who led the world through or led employers through COVID. You know, we had the front lines, the nurses, the doctors leading people through the pandemic, but we were leading the world through or leading employers through the process of maintaining their company and, and keeping it afloat and managing the people part of the pandemic. So um, I think right now, HR is in a key position to essentially say, look at everything I've accomplished. And hopefully HR was really becoming a partner to leadership if they weren't already. Um, so if you're in HR, hopefully you're feeling like you had a chance to really demonstrate your ability to lead and to partner with the leadership. Um, and so now we really have an opportunity to, to use our voice, I think. So I, I just really think HR is in a position to um, have some serious impact. And so in terms of talent acquisition there you know there's so much to it talent acquisition and employee experience can almost be one role or those two individuals better be working very closely together if they're not the same person that um, part of how you acquire talent is by having a stellar employee experience and the right kind of culture and so there's so many moving parts um, now in hr and i think too they're all interrelated you know we can't be siloing talent acquisition and um, culture and DEI and, you know, they all have some crossover. So that's, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, no, de definitely. I think that's a, a great point, right? About the silos. We just, we can't be in this place where, um, you know, where we are looking at everything as these separate entities, because that's not the way that, um, HR is working anymore. It's not also the way that the world is working. Mm -hmm. We really have to think about how do we impact each of those um, those those verticals, and then not only how do we impact it, but if we are having to be the person that's doing multiple of that, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, like, I just pulled up because I was like, what did I put into my diversity recruiting course? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> we do have quite a few of these courses. I mean, you've got uh, over ten courses, I think. On the platform, I have. Right? I have thirty-one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah 
So, I mean, there's a number of them out there. Sometimes you go, wait, what did I tell people? <laughs> you know, I, I, I had the pleasure of just redoing my strategic HR course. So the one that's out there now will, current, will be replaced here shortly. And, you know, previously I had done that course in 2017. It didn't have a DEI. I mean, obviously I mentioned it, through, but it wasn't. But now there's a whole piece in there about strategic HR involves that too. So it's interesting how even not that many years later, my strategic right. HR course is like total. I did a complete overhaul. It's totally different. Right. So, I mean, that's a great point, right? For people to be thinking about is we're in this place. I've been talking a lot about evolution right? Uh, mm -hmm. recently, the evolution of work, the evolution of DEI. Um, and you're right, five years ago, six years ago, I mean, we were talking about DEI. It was kind of this, this thing that HR we talk about sometimes, and maybe if you had a, you know, a progressive or an innovative leader, they would listen, but it really wasn't something, you know, it was something like the larger companies were doing, right? Because mm -hmm. there was visibility into it and it was focused there. But for smaller companies, it was kind of like, oh, that's not for us. That's for those folks over right. there. Um, right. And now we're realizing, oh no, everyone actually needs to, to deal with this. So I think it is important to realize that part of, whatever you're doing, right, in your role, DEI does need to be brought in. Mm -hmm. um, and when we start thinking about these talent acquisition, um, you know, like I said, right now, this whole great reevaluation, um, part of that is even in something as simple as, you know, one of the, the modules in my, my course is on crafting better job descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, uh, I always go into companies and I say, listen, I know you, you're gonna, you wanna run me out of here when I say this, but I need you to take all of your job descriptions, or at least the, the job postings, and you need to throw them out and you need to start over. <laughs> yeah. now, I'm not saying do them all at once, <laughs> right? Yeah. But every time you have a new job, I need you to start from scratch. I need you to stop taking the old school template that you have and just changing a word here or there and just doing a little refresh and and yeah. if even that, right? Some of the, some of the you don't even refresh. We just copy and paste, right? Right, right. Um, so I think that that is really important to be able to just write there because what we do find is with job descriptions, once you put it down on paper, once you write it, it is literally like Moses came down with the tablets. It is written in stone and mm -hmm. that's not changing. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, very careful about what you have put into that job description because everyone is going to work to that. Right, right. And I, I like what you're saying too. I always say, you know, the job description is really an internal document. It's like the manual for doing the job and the job posting is like the flyer, you know, and you, you know, Apple phone wouldn't use their user's manual PDF to advertise Apple, they use the thing that draws you in and then you get the description of how to use it. Um, and, and that's job job postings are meant to draw people in. Um, so on that note, I'm curious, what are some in diversity recruiting, what are some of the key things that we need to be thinking about when we are writing our job postings in order to attract more diverse candidates? We need to start with less is more. <laughs> Right. Less is definitely more. Um, and, and even this isn't even a DEI thing, right? This is just job description in general. We're frustrated that we can't find can't find candidates right now. Um, and I use air quotes because I'm like, they are out there. This mm -hmm. is we can find the candidates. Right. So. Again, not necessarily even a DEI thing, just a human thing. Nobody wants to spend a ton of time applying to your job. You're not special. <laughs> I want to say this to all the company leaders out there, right? You are not special. So stop making people have to jump through 30 hoops mm -hmm. just to apply, right? Make it simple. Make it easy. And we are in this, and this is where I guess some of the DEI does come in, is because we have been in this um, space where our job is, and I say our job, I mean, in terms from a talent acquisition perspective, um, is to screen out, right? We want to say, oh, you're not qualified. Oh, you don't have enough experience. Nope, nope, nope. We want to get rid of as many people from the pipeline as possible to make our jobs easier. Let's just narrow it down. We'll get the top yeah. three, and that's our people. And it's like, no, we have to stop doing that because what we're doing is putting up all of these barriers, barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier, 
And then we can't fathom why we can't seem to identify a candidate. Right, right. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, take we got to take a real different approach. Because I'm thinking when I first started HR, you would put your job posting out and admittedly it was a lot like the job it probably was the job description um and then they people would fax it in you know you weren't even putting your email out there really it was like fax your resume in and so there really was just like you and the piece of paper and then you really would go through that paper to figure out how to eliminate people and then yeah you'd have your top candidates but now we've got social media we're networking in different ways. I mean, I'm my my networking group is all over the country. And now all of a sudden I'm networking with all of these members all over the country. And so it, um, it's just that spray and pray, the putting it out there and hoping the right resume comes faxed through is just so gone. So we, I guess that's a, a piece where we were talking about changes in talent acquisition that it's looking at LinkedIn. It's thinking about the connections you have, asking your employees what connections they have. It's um, being creative, but keeping it simple. And um, there's just so many new ways. Right. And then I think, what's it going to be in 10 years from now? It's going to be even more different. I think we, we still boil it down to the spray and, 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 and pray kind of, right? No matter what we do, we've just, we're just spraying in more places. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right. We right. just have a few more avenues to do it, but it's really, it's the same mindset. Right. And so that's what we actually have to work with. That's the DEI piece is what is the mindset of the recruiter, the talent acquisition person who's going out and um, are you actually being proactive mm -hmm. in wanting a diverse pipeline or are you kind of just saying that because that's what the company says, or like that's the line, but then you're still doing the same thing that you've always been doing. Right. right, exactly. We're, we're going out to the, all these other places, but we're still bringing them back in to the same exact pipeline and the same exact process that we've used for the last 20 years. And we need to get rid of that pipeline and process. Yeah. Or that and that mindset of spray and pray. So would you say, um, you know, I, I think um, one tip you always see in terms of recruiting for more diversity is um you know, going out in the community, for example, San Diego, where I am, has a huge LGBT community. Um, so if I'm thinking I'd like to tap into that group, um, I could start joining community events. I could become a member at the LGBTQ Center. I could, um, you know, is, is that and then you sort of start to just meet people and curate relationships and, and network through that group that you're targeting and through that process you would start to be able to bring candidates in and um, have some bench candidates i guess is a new phrase i've been seeing lately <clears throat> yeah definitely that that's what we would want to see and we would see that a lot right like but again i always look at the mindset of that because if i'm the person who has a very sort of clear idea in my head of what the candidate is going to look like and what I think, you know, who they should be, right? I can go to the LGBTQ center and I can go to the pride parade and I can meet all kinds of people. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm still going to hire the cisgender white male that I happen to find at the pride parade, right? Right, right. But I'm going to say, I went to the pride parade, right? Yeah. I did my due diligence. And this man just happened to be the best person for the job. Right, right. Because right. my bias said so. <laughs> so how do you, because you can't, I, as far as I understand, it's illegal to have like a quota, like we need 10% of LGBTQ population, or I'm really focused on that. Like I'm a small company. I can't go and say, I, I want to make sure one person on my staff is LGBTQ. So how do you, it, how do you get past that? You know, like, because I can't, necessarily leave that white cisgender male out of the right. pool. Right, you, and, and exactly that. You can't do a quota, but you can have, um, you know, kind of as you said, there's this idea that, okay, well, let's look at um, what percentage of our population, our employee base uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, part of the LGBT community. Let's look at um, what percentage of our customer base is part of the LGBT community. And then let's look at our employees to see, does it match up? Right. So if we're selling, 
right? Let's say I'm going to use really outlandish numbers to make it easy, right? But let's just say 50% of our client base are LGBTQ customers, but only 3% of our employees are LGBTQ. We have a, a disconnect, right? Yeah. So we have to be able to go out and, and say, yeah, we need to increase that. Now, are we going to say we have to increase it by 20%? No. But we are going to say we need to get closer to the population of the people that we actually serve. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I've been thinking, too, um, a lot lately about professionalism and deconstructing that phrase. And I think um, because professionalism is like cisgender white people, and if you if you're going into different communities where people don't look like you, that that also means we have to like if we're going to really be inclusive, we can't use or we need to redefine professionalism. And even like I have a tattoo here, which I had wanted forever. And, you know, since I was probably 20, I'm 42 now and I just got it recently because I finally decided, you know, and I never did it because it wasn't professional. And I was like, you know what? If someone doesn't want to do business with me because I have a tattoo that means a lot to me on my wrist, then I don't want to do business with them either. But so even something little like this, but, you know, the we just I think we we as part of inclusivity is really deconstructing what professionalism means and exactly what it looks like and and redefining that. Right. Well, and because I remember, you know, I worked in financial services and um, and like in, in the banking area where you could not, you know, have visible tattoos. You mm -hmm. couldn't, you know, like nothing. It was very, very specific what you were allowed to do. And mm -hmm. even though they wouldn't say in, in some arenas, they finally stopped saying, OK, you can't have a tattoo. OK, fine. We didn't put it down. It wasn't a policy. Right. But the practice was. We right. weren't going to hire you if you had a tattoo. Right. right. And so right. that's what we always look at. It's like, yeah, look at your practices, your policies and your procedures, because you can have all the policies in the world. Right. HR right. is great for writing these wonderful policies. But are we making sure that we are actually practicing them right, in the way that they're supposed to be? Uh, practiced in a lot of, in a lot of, I mean, we, we know how to get around things. So we do that a lot. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that comes up too, when we talk about, you know, recruiting for diversity is I've gotten questions like, okay, well, I'm white. Is it okay for me to go and recruit at an HBCU, which for those of you who don't know, is historically black college or university. <coughs> Excuse me. And I've been like, well, why not? Yeah. Why, I, why wouldn't you, right? The reason that you're going to have a white person maybe feel uncomfortable about going to an HBCU is because they have not done the work to actually feel comfortable being in that space. And so I'm like, in that case, then don't go yeah. <laughs> because you yeah. will not be effective. <laughs> right. So it's not that you're not allowed to go. It's that you haven't done the work that is going to make you to be effective in that space. Cause I'm telling you right now, I have no problem going like, so oh, an example, I just came back from the black enterprise women of power summit all okay. black people right black women i was telling another friend about it and she said oh well i don't think i can go because i'm not black and i'm like why not let me tell you right now if you're going to a persian whatever event right and you ask me to come with you i'll come yeah i have no problem yeah. i will go i want to learn i want to see what's what's going on you know what yeah i might get a couple of stares from people but i'm gonna be like i'm here to learn i want to right but if you can't be comfortable doing that, then yeah, don't go. <laughs> right. That's, that's a great point. <laughs> so, so good tip here. Employers don't just send people off to events until you're sure they are ready and prepared and educated um, enough to be effective. Yeah, that's a good, a good point. Right. Right. And that's a lot of the, the work that we do. So right now I'm spending a lot of time trying to get companies to just even be aware that mm -hmm. this is a problem. And you might say, because I know you've done this work for a long time and go, well, all these companies should be aware. But how many times, Catherine, have you gone into a company and been like, wow, it's like 1950 in here. <laughs> I'm still, I don't know why I'm still shocked, but I still am at least once a week. I'm like, really? That's what happened? <laughs> I, don't, I don't. As much experience as I have, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I'm sure you do as well. All of us in HR 
Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of this too is getting people comfortable, but when they haven't had the opportunity to practice, right, or to, to do this work, and they haven't been shown how to do it, then we're going to continue to have these false starts and these um, inefficient results. So what I'm really spending a lot of time doing is saying, look, let me come into your company. Let me just talk to people. Let's just do a town hall. Let's just have conversations because people have to get socialized to this conversation. Mm-hmm. I can't come in and let's say, let's train all of your talent acquisition team to go out and go to HBCUs because they're not ready, right? They don't yeah. have, they're not in the right mindset to even take this information in. Yeah. So yeah. there are steps that have to be taken. It's not about one workshop, right? That's not going to do it. And this is why it's been ineffective because, you know, again, I'm not no scientist. I, I don't do a lot with adult learning theory, right? But I definitely have to use pieces of it in the work that I do. And I realize that if you are going to be an adult learner, you can't take something in one time and absorb anything. Right. At best, you're going to absorb like 5%. At right. best. Right. Right. So the only way to absorb that work and that information is you've got to hear it again and again. You've got to be immersed in it. You've got to experience it. You got to hear it. You got to talk about it. Right. All of those things have to happen. So we have to create an environment where those things can happen. Yeah. And by the way, LinkedIn Learning has a whole bunch of courses, one of which is Stacy's on things like unconscious bias and being an ally and, um, you know, talking about race at work. And so their LinkedIn learning has a, in fact, that's on my, uh, my quarterly plan this month or this co- coming quarter is to listen to as many of those as I can while I'm driving and, and learning. So yeah, um, I want to go back to bias course was actually number one for 2021. It was the most watched course. So if you've not watched the unconscious bias course, please watch that one. Uh, because we're very so close to cool. hitting 1 million views. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. You're a celebrity. I mean, there are probably thousands of LinkedIn learning courses. So for you to be number one is, and, and it's amazing and also a sign that people are curious. So that's awesome. Um, we've got yeah. someone posting the link for us. Thank you. And also earlier, um, our two courses that are in this Pathfinder, Diversity Recruiting and Strategic HR are also posted. So thank you. I think it was Amber, who did that. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to go back to something you said about um, following policies and things, too, because that's something I see as well. You know, when I'm going into a toxic work environment where there's been harassment or what have you, it's like, well, you have a harassment prevention policy. You're not following it. And it is only as good as as the the behavior that follows from that policy. And that's something I talk about, too, in my strategic HR course, that if Part of strategic HR is certainly immersing into the culture and everything that HR does has to be immersed in the culture and using the core values. Um, And so, and same with your corporate policies. And I think, again, that's where that silo is. Like here's a compliancy sort of document, um, you know, and so it's, it's gonna read one way, but our core values say that we're inclusive and innovative. Well, if your policy isn't innovative or inclusive, or you're not following it, then there's a real disconnect there. So, um, you know, if you, I just, I find that interesting. So if you're gonna say, these are our core values, what should HR be doing to ensure that HR and the policies that HR is putting out there are part of that so that everyone else can live those core values too. So I think HR's duty to the core values is twofold. One, it's related to their own job. How am I, curating the core values and making sure that they're being lived out and everything happening within the HR realm, um, you know, and also personally, how I guess it's threefold. Personally, how am I living the core values? How is HR as a department living the core values through every little thing that we're doing? And then what are the programs we have in place for the rest of the workforce related to our core values? Um, And so there's a, a lot of, so many organizations ignore the core values. And I'm just so fascinated by that. You know, I, I'm i a, a, a consultant that goes into toxic workplaces. Most of the time, those are the, the workplaces that we're, we're in. And I'm always just fascinated, like, oh, I see inclusivity and respect as one of your core values. What am I doing here? You know, but it's just, they've been ignoring that core value. And it's, it's well, interesting. It's not even so much ignoring it. Let's be real. Half of them don't know what their core value is. Right, right. There's that. And then we also have a lot of the organizations that I go into, 
their core values, they're old, right? Mm -hmm. Or they haven't embedded DEI into those values. Mm -hmm. So you want to tell me that your core value is civility and respect. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. What does that mean? Right. Right. How? How how do I show civility and respect? Because you know what? I might be one of these individuals who I believe that in order for you to show respect to me, I need you to use ma'am and sir when you speak to me, right? Right. But I'm never going to do that because that's not how I speak. So now you believe I am disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Am I disrespectful, right? What are the guidelines, right? What does it actually mean to be respectful in this workplace? What does it actually mean to treat someone with civility, right? What does that look like? And so half the time, we got these wonderful flowery 12 letter words (laughs) as part of our (laughs) value system. And one, we don't know they're there. And two, we are enforcing them in ways that don't actually um, treat people with the, yeah. in, in the way that we would expect it to show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, you know, so Civility Partners has our five core values. There's only five of us. So it's a lot easier to manage core values. But when I look at our core values, I don't, I feel like I don't have to audit us. Like those are the core, those, they really represent me. I'm the leader and they really represent my team as we grow, which is the plan. I think, um, you know, that we're going to have to, figure out more about how to make sure we are living the core values. But I I do find that they're easy to live because they're truly who we are. And our core values are things like learn a lot, take care of yourself, um, be extraordinary. You know, these are these are just normal things that we all do. And versus like if you're going to say something fluffy, um, it's hard for people to to engage in that. And I, I'll give a um, loving what you were talking about, like, what does civility even mean? So here's an exercise that I do in a ton of our training programs. I'm going to share it with everyone. Um, we ask the question, how would you like to be treated at work? And you could use Mentimeter where people can type in and it'll create a word cloud, or you can just have people to put it in the chat. The question is, how would you like to be treated at work? And then inevitably everyone says with respect, um, you know, some of these very standard words, um, if I want to be effectively communicated with, but to your point, what does that even mean? So then part two of that exercise is to do exactly what you said. Let's, okay, let's define respect. That's a word that 99% of you shared. So let's talk about that. What does that really mean? Um, And it's fascinating to see all of the variety of answers. So then if you're doing this as a manager, for example, with your team, you can pull all of that and say, okay, here's what respect looks like inside of our team based on what everyone said it meant. Only one time, this was a law firm, only one time did most people have the same answer, answer to that question, what does respect mean, which was to feel heard. And so Now we know at that law firm, the one place where everyone agreed on what respect was, it was if I feel heard, then that's how I feel respected. Um, So these are, you know, it's it's just digging into those words that we throw around. We can't assume everybody thinks that they're the same because they're right. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. And and that's that's really what I, I try, you know, to get across. I realize I always talk about the fact that diversity equity and inclusion in the workplace doesn't have to be hard, right? It is literally that simple, but it, it, it's difficult because we don't have these conversations. Like we have to break it down to this like really simple baseline level. And it's so difficult for us to do because we feel like, well, it should be this, this big strategy and we should have all this flowery stuff and we should have this. It's like, no, we don't need a 60 page report. <laughs> we really right. don't. Right. <laughs> As I promise you we don't. What we need is to feel heard. What we need is to know that I can show up to work with a tattoo on my wrist and not be ostracized by people or get written up, right? What I need is to be able to come into work and know that somebody else has my back and hasn't been talking about me in the meeting (laughs) when I wasn't there, right? Like that's what we need. Um, And just, it's just, it's frustrating, right? We have to actually, (laughs) we have to say these things. And then not only that, but we have to put, policies and, and and procedures into place to make you do them when they should come naturally. That's the HR part, right? <laughs> HR, you know, uh, HR has been forced into this like half lawyer, 
have people stuff. And it's a weird balance, right? Because your your job is to be compliant, make sure policies are compliant. And unfortunately, lawmakers force those things. But then you're also supposed to be strategic in how you work with the people there. And, um, you know, I often say if you're strategic HR, the compliance stuff comes a lot more naturally. If people feel valued. They're not going to violate policies the way that they will if they feel like they're not valued, you know, so. Right. Right. It's a lot easier to manage behavior. People are happy. <laughs> it's, it's funny how that works. <laughs> I, know, I know, right? Gone are the days of like, back the whip, right? Um, yeah, it is indeed. crazy, though, to see how much the paradigm has shifted. And for those of us in HR, we see it. But to go into these companies that we go into that do still feel like 20 years ago, it's like, that's no, that's not how we're doing it now. And it's not going to, I just, I'm very curious to see when we're having our LinkedIn conversation 10 years from now, Stacy, what will we be talking about? <laughs> I know it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, so I think we've got a lot of, um, a lot of possibilities right in front of us. And yeah. Um, yeah. I'm excited to see what it's going to look like, right? How things are going to evolve. Um, and so we're actually going to have a follow-up conversation, uh, April 19th, I believe it is. I think so. Um, so, and we're going to do this in a kind of a fun way this time. So we're going to go a little bit more with, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We're going to go with an audio event. So that is going to allow us to do a follow-up uh, to this conversation. And what we'll be able to do is kind of an ask me anything uh, type conversation. So here, I know it's kind of uh, tough with LinkedIn because you gotta type your question in. And I know for me, I am not a typer, I need to talk. I am a talker through and through. <laughs> so uh, that's why I really like the audio events because you'll actually be able to um, unmute yourself and come up and talk and ask questions. So um, that I think will be a really great way for us to be able to do that. And I'm going to drop the link in for that in a moment. Awesome. We have a question from Lisa. And by the way, anybody else, please do feel free to put questions in there. So Lisa says she's an ambassador uh, for DEI at work and she shares three to five minute videos in team meetings, but she's not sure they're received well. So how could she get people to feel comfortable about the subject? Hmm to get comfortable about talking about DEI. Well, I mean, so the thing I will say is this, we are always going to get it wrong. And so part of our concern is we say, well, I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And what we try to get across is that it's okay. It's okay to get it wrong. What is really, really important is what you say after you get it wrong. So apologizing, because here's the thing, if we're not good at it, how are you going to get better at it without trying? Mm -hmm. And if we know we're not good at it, it means that when we start, we're not going to be good at it. Mm -hmm. But the only way to get better is we've got to practice. But you can't practice if you say, well, I'm not going to do it until I'm good at it. Right. Yeah. Like it just that can never happen. Right. That makes sense. So Lisa, does that help? Is there um, some, uh, maybe maybe just saying that, repeating what Stacy just said, that, hey, um, this is something that uh, we've all got a lot of work to do. And maybe, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like too, I'm certainly the leader has to show support that they're interested in, in the DEI content that you're showing too. Well, I think it's also about, um, <sighs> understanding that we're in a space where um, we have to have grace, right? So if we're authentic in how we're showing up, if we're, if we're genuine in our interest, then people are gonna be, are going to see that. And that's going to be uh, okay for them, right? They're going mm -hmm. to see, oh, okay, uh, this person really was trying, but they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have a lot of times is we're not really genuine, right? We're doing things, we're being performative, we're saying it because we feel like we have to, um, but we really don't believe what we're saying. Mm -hmm. So when you believe what you're saying, people feel it, they know it. Like I always, I love Judge Judy when she, what was it she said? Like, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. 
<laughs> Haven't heard that, but I like that. <laughs> and, and that's really what a lot of this has been like, right? People are running around here, peeing on people's legs, right? And then trying to gaslight them and tell them it's raining. Right. And we're like, we're not that stupid, right? And, and that's really what we're dealing with. But when you are a genuine person who really is interested, like I said, if, if I show up, I want to go to a, a Persian a Persian women's conference, right? If I show up and I'm not there, I'm not there to gawk. I'm not there to be like, ooh, what's that you're eating? Oh, that's different. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting costume you're wearing, right? Like, I'm not doing that. I'm right. showing up because I'm really interested to learn. Teach me something, right? I want to come here and absorb. I'm going to be quiet and, and learn. That's a different um, right. way of, of, of dealing with, with the situation, right? So we really have to be 100% honest with ourselves and look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, how are we showing up? Right. Because the other part of it is if you really don't want to engage because you really don't care, then say that and just go away. Yeah. But don't come yeah. to the party and act like you want to be there when we all know you don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's and it's weird how being genuine has to be a piece of advice, right? Like that. Just be, just be genuine. That's that's all. Just be a human. I mean, done. We're done, Stacey. We've said all we need to say. Just be human. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. Let's see. We've got another question. How do I get leadership on board with rolling out a DEI strategy? That's a hard one. Um, and I'm, I'm being honest on that one. I always say, let's make it simple. But that one is a hard one. <laughs> and it's hard because, um, again, it goes back to what I just said. Do they actually want to do it? So literally, that's the question I always ask. I start with, do you genuinely believe that this is something that needs to be addressed? And do you genuinely believe that it is something you can address? Mm -hmm. If the answer to both of those questions are yes, we can play ball. If you're not sure, you need to go away and think about it. Yeah. But don't start a whole process and an agenda and a strategy and an initiative and expect that these individuals are gonna lead it when they can't answer both of those questions in the affirmative. That's a great point. I wonder too, just kind of going back to our thought about human being human, you know, in my work of toxic work environments, or, you know, I specialize in workplace bullying and the people who are bullying or the, usually the person I'm coaching to not be a bully is pretty high up, probably reports directly to the CEO, if not close to it. Like these are high level people who the CEO is allowed to act that way because they're seen as valuable. So, um, I just think about that type of a leader who's allowing that sort of pain to happen. They're also not the type of leader who's they're they're not going to be engaged in DEI in the way that they need to be either. And I feel like there's a lot of those types of leaders. We have such an uphill battle because I mean I'm still I'm busy <laughs> because there's so many of those types of leaders who seem to. It's not that they don't care. They're not like horrible, evil people. It's that they've lost sight. I think that humanity is a key component of leadership. And um, I don't know. I'm just sort of babbling now. I do feel like there's a lot of leaders who have lost sight of just people need to feel good at work, um, be it because we need to eliminate bullying or create a DEI plan. And, you know, I don't know. Leaders just in general need to get more people oriented. I, I, yes, yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh gosh. All right. Well, um, I just posted, I think I posted, I might end up doing this twice, but oh, it failed to post my comment. Okay. Well, oh, it wouldn't let me post we'll the, post um, it. you could get it posted after we get off here. Clarissa says creating psychological safety in circles that make it conducive for learning and making mistakes so they can evolve at their own pace is key. Yeah, that's for sure. You got to feel comfortable that if you make a mistake, it won't come down on hard on you that right. as long as you recognize and own your mistake, <laughs> then you'll be okay. But that does require psychological safety. Indeed. So. Oh, look here. I just sent you the link on the chat there. So then maybe you can post it. Uh, but that is okay. the link to the audio event. So for April 19th, you will join us and you'll have the opportunity to ask us anything. So anything you didn't get a chance to ask us today, anything that today's conversation sparked, if you haven't had the opportunity to watch our courses, 
go watch the courses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you can come on back with questions and we look forward to being able to connect with you then. And that, again, it's going to be an audio event. I think it's still in LinkedIn beta right now. So you'll get an opportunity to try out a new format, kind of Clubhouse style. Am I allowed to say Clubhouse on LinkedIn? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm sure the format that it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> so watch our courses, show up at this new uh, in our audio, and then we can actually talk instead of uh having you post so <laughs> yeah i'm looking forward to an actual conversation with all of you so join us then yeah all right thank you bye stacy it was good to see you and i'll see you soon <laughs> yeah wonderful all right bye, bye.